Hello, I'm Shay. Um, if you don't know me, I'm the president of Math Talk, but that's irrelevant for today because I'm a speaker on the um, open lecture. So I'll just share my, uh, where is it? There it is. Okay, so um, I'm going to be giving a presentation on uh, popular maths, which you've probably heard of before. It's a genre of um, mathematical books or presentation. Um, and then I'm going to be showcasing an example of um, sort of a popular maths article that I've written for my um, third year project. Um, so we'll start off by just talking about what popular maths is, um, just to define it for anyone who hasn't maybe heard of it before. Um, so we've got a nice quote here from Richard Feynman, who um, I know a lot of people have probably heard of. He's a famous American physicist who put together a series of lectures on physics, um, which essentially made physics accessible to anyone, even without a background knowledge of advanced physics or anything like that. Um, he's very famous in sort of the science world, um, and he's got some quite notable students as well, including Stephen Wolfram, who you may have heard of um, because he created Wolfram Alpha. Um, so let's talk about what popular maths is. Um, so as I said, it's a popular, it's a, a genre of mathematical presentation which aims to present high level maths to those who may not, uh, may not otherwise have access to it. Um, so why is it needed? Um, well, to put it quite simply, in the world we live in at the minute, maths is everywhere. Um, over the past year especially, we've had um, sort of Professor Chris Whitty on our telly giving us graphs, numbers, data, maths, it's everywhere. Um, We've got maths sort of not just in the presentations by the government, but every everyday things we do, like uh, driving places, walking places, you can find maths everywhere. Um, so that's a that's a big reason why maths needs to be accessible to everyone. Um, another big reason that popular maths specifically needs to be accessible to everyone is because people don't necessarily have the skills to be able to understand uh, high level mathematics, which most of us here today can understand. Um, so there was a study by the Department of Innovation and Skills in 2011, um, which showed this number, 53% of the UK population between 16 and 65 have numeracy skills that are equivalent to GCSE level. Um, and I find that quite shocking, um, because if you were to say the same thing about English, for example, um, or literacy, that would be a very shocking thing to a lot of people. So numeracy is sort of slipping through the cracks a bit and people don't see quite how serious it is that people don't understand maths to uh, not necessarily the level that we do at degree level, but maybe just maths that everyone would use in their everyday life. Um, so why do, why is this statistic a thing? Why are so many people sort of at this quite low level of maths in life? Well, there's two main reasons. Um, one, they just didn't have the understanding. Maybe they didn't have a good teacher at school or they didn't get maths at school. And that's very normal. I mean, I know people who really didn't get on with maths at school and that's completely normal. Um, everyone does learn in the same way. And unfortunately in the classroom, not every teacher can sort of tailor their lesson to every student. It's just not possible with a class of say 20 to 30 students. Um, another big reason is people just don't have the access to it. Um, so think people in third world countries who might not have money or access to the internet or a good education system. Um, I'm willing to bet actual money that there's probably some person in the third world that could easily be the next Einstein and they just don't have the access or facilities to make that so. Um, so that's sort of the need for popular maths, just to sort of be able to take advanced maths and tailor it to people who may not have access to it in the formal sense that we do. Um, so how does it work? Um, so Essentially, there's quite a few different techniques. Um, I'm just going to list a few of them. Um, one of them is uh, illumination, which is recognized by Stephen Strogatz um, in a paper that he wrote. If you'd like to see that paper, contact me afterwards and I can send it to you. Um, and essentially by illumination, he means providing the reader with sort of aha moments, letting them see um, that they do understand things. So maybe starting from a very basic level when describing a topic and sort of letting them build up the understanding from the fundamentals and sort of maybe posing a question which the reader could easily get and letting them get the answer correct. And so they feel like they're achieving something, getting somewhere, and they'll be more motivated to carry on from that. Um, another good one is using numerical examples instead of generalized cases. So most of us here today are math students, and we know from sort of lecture notes or mathematical texts that 
is a big thing to use generalized cases and formulas and all of that and it can be very abstracting and hard to understand for someone who doesn't have the background knowledge that we do um, so for example with theorems and sort of definitions and stuff it is all using sort of algebra letters instead of numbers um, things like greek symbols and integral signs people might not know how to pronounce them they might not know what they mean and so it's really important to give sort of numbers which people people do know what numbers are um, so instead of describing for example um, i don't know uh, um, Pythag pythagoras in uh, letters. I know it's a very simple thing and a lot of people do understand the Pythagoras theorem, but using numbers, using examples is a really good way to get someone to understand it. Um, I always find that when I'm going through my lecture notes, I have to construct a few numerical examples to be able to understand things. And so it's a really good thing to sort of do that for the reader. Do the um, examples yourself and let them learn from the examples. Um, another one is rehumanizing mathematics, and that sort of follows on from sort of generalizing cases, abstracting things. Um, it's important to show that math does have a human element to it. Um, there's a good TED talk by, uh, I think he's called Randy Polisok, and he talks about how math is a language, um, and it sort of really shows that math is a human subject, and I think it's really important to show the reader this, um, show them that there is an element of humanity to it. Um, and there's a load of ways of doing this. And I think one way that I've seen in quite a few popular maths books, which I really like, is sort of giving a bit of backstory to why we're looking at the certain topic that um, is being discussed. Um, so maybe provide a conversation that you had before you started looking into it and show the motivation of why you started looking into it. Um, so that's a really good thing. Another one is treating the reader as a good friend. Um, so talk quite informally, um, make chatty remarks and sort of tell them what you're saying as if they're your friend sat next to you in the pub who's just asked you a maths question. Um, another one is to make connections and analogies to the real world. Um, so a good example I can think of this, um, sort of if you're explaining parabolic motion, someone's gonna understand it a lot better if you talk about kicking the football from the halfway line to the back of the net and talking about how to kick the football. And it's gonna be very abstracting to sort of put it across as, particles moving in Euclidean space. People don't know what that means. So relate it to a real life example that people A, will understand and B, might be interested in. Um, and guide and engage the reader's thoughts. So a good way to do this is to maybe in introduce a dialogue into the text. Because um, as I say, um, maths is all about questions. It's all about asking questions and the reader might not know to ask questions. And if they do, they might not know what questions to ask. So give the questions to the reader or sort of motivate them and sort of sheep them almost into getting the questions that you want them to ask. Um, a good example of this is in Plato's Republic. Um, I know it's not a mathematical text, but it happens there and it's sort of, that's a good example of guiding the reader's thoughts through the use of a dialogue. Um, so we've got a nice quote here from Stephen Struggart, so I'll let you read that. Um, and that sort of sums up my last point, really. Uh, you have to help the person sort of, you have to give them the questions uh, in order to help them understand what you're talking about. Um, so I'm going to get started with my popular maths article now, which I've written for my third year project. Um, and it's all about Sudoku puzzles. Um, so I'll give you a bit of backstory to it. Um, so over the past year, we've all been stuck in lockdown, obviously, and my girlfriend Rachel and I have been FaceTiming and doing puzzles on our iPads every day using an app called Puzzle Page. And it has everything from sort of word searches to picture puzzles, number puzzles, and a load of other things. And I love the number puzzles. Um, and occasionally we'll do a Sudoku together. And a few uh, months back, she asked me a question, which was, how many Sudoku puzzles are there? Um, so at first glance, I thought it would be quite an easy question to solve. Uh, the more I worked on it and the more I got stuck, um, I realized that it was actually trickier than I thought it would be. Um, I kept it in Roblox and I eventually looked it up online and to my surprise, I saw that it had fact only been answered in 2005, which is surprisingly recent for how simple a question I thought it was. Um, so I started to think actually maybe it's a bit trickier than it first seemed. Um, I sat and read through the solution and to my surprise, it wasn't actually that hard at all. In fact, it was as easy as making a cup of tea. Um, so for 
the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to describe a nine by nine Sudoku grid, which is the sort of standard size that uh, you might recognize. I'm going to instead be using a four by four grid, and it works in exactly the same way as the nine by nine grid, um, except obviously instead of having three by three blocks, you've got two by two blocks, which are populated with the numbers one through four. Um, but the techniques I'll use are essentially exactly the same as what you'd use in a nine by nine grid. Um, it's just, it'll be slightly different because obviously the numbers are different and it's a slightly bigger grid with more blocks. But on, on the sort of surface of it, it is very similar. Um, so you're probably thinking, how on earth does Sudoku relate to making a cup of tea? Um, well, if you think about your cup of tea, you've got the process of making it and you have some ingredients. Now, what are those ingredients? I know it seems silly to call them ingredients because it makes it sort of makes making a cup of tea sound like a recipe and it's not really that but let's call it ingredients for um sort of the purpose of this and um, we have four ingredients we have the tea bag the sugar the milk and the uh, hot water um and you can put these in the cup in any order i know that might offend some people uh, some people might think there's only one way to do it and that's their way and that's fair enough but um some people do do it differently for example some people might put the sugar in first and dare I say it, some people put the hot water in before putting anything else in. Um, so let's have a look at some of these methods. So personally, I make my cup of tea like this. I put the uh, tea bag in first, then the sugar, then the milk, and then I pour the um, hot water in and I'll leave it to brew for two minutes. Um, so there's another method here as well. So um, this time someone might put the milk in last and put the hot water in third. So they put the same two ingredients in first. It's just the last two ingredients that have swapped around. Um, here we've got another one. Someone may even put the milk in second and um, this will make two more methods. So you'll have the sugar third and the hot water last and the hot water third and the sugar last. Um, then we've got an, another um, way of doing it, which is putting the tea bag in first. Then you've got the hot water second and you've got the milk, then the sugar. And then obviously you could swap around the milk and sugar there to put the um, sugar in third and the milk in last. And these are all the possible ways of making a cup of tea with the tea bag going in first. Um, so we've got six possible methods or in maths we call these permutations, um, which I'm sure most of you are aware of. Um, and obviously this is where we put the tea bag in first. Um, so I will just define permutation for anyone who might not know what it is. Um, it's just a fancy way of referring to the way of arranging or ordering a different set of objects or um, numbers. So, for example, uh, arranging the numbers one and two, there's two permutations. So you can either have one and two or two and one. Um, so let's go back to the Sudoku very slightly. And we're going to relabel our um, ingredients for the cup of tea with a number. So the tea bag will be one, the sugar will be two, milk will be three and hot water will be four. Um, so here we go, we've got a storyboard of how I make my cup of tea. So obviously I put the tea bag, then the sugar, then the milk, and then the hot water. And we can make a two by two storyboard representing this using the numbers we just did. Um, so obviously my one, we labeled it such that it'd be one, two, three, four, and there's our storyboard up the top. Um, another example is to put the tea bag in first, then the sugar, then the hot water, then the milk, and that would be one, two, four, three. Um, so what has this got to do with Sudoku? Um, you may have popped it already by putting numbers into two by two grids, um, but let's go back a step and imagine this. So you've boiled your kettle, you've got your cup ready, your tea bag is in your hand, your milk is ready to pour, and you've got your teaspoon of sugar ready. How many ways can we make the cup of tea? Um, so obviously we've been through a few examples of this, but let's take it back to foundations. Let's understand the maths behind it. So we've got our four ingredients first. Um, and with the four ingredients there, we've got a choice of four things that we can put in. Um, so for example, as painful it is, as it is to say, let's start with the hot water. So we put the hot water in and we've got three more ingredients left to put in. Um, so we can pick any three of these to go in next. Um, so we've chosen the milk, that's even more disgusting. So we may as well complete this in and we'll put the um, sugar in next. And that leaves the tea bag to go in last. So we had a choice of four ingredients for the first, then three, then two, and now we've got one ingredient left to go in. And um, yeah, sorry about that. That's a horrible ordering of making a cup of tea. 
Um, so as we said, we've got four choices for the first ingredient. And then for every choice of first ingredient, we had three choices for the second ingredient. Next, we had two choices um, for the third ingredient. And then that left us with one more ingredient add, uh, to add to the cup. And so we have one choice for that. Um, there's a lot of information here, so let's cut it down to just what we really care about. And that is how many choices we had for each step. So we had four for the first, three for the second, two for the third, and one for the final. Um, so from this, we can multiply the numbers together and we can find how many permutations there are of the ingredients. And that, of course, is four times three times two times one, which gives us 24. And um, obviously in maths, we call this a factorial. And we've got the definition of factorial there. Um, but I won't patronize you. I'm sure you know what a factorial is. Um, so next, this is where it all comes together. Um, by replacing the ingredients of numbers, as we did earlier, we can see that there are going to be 24 permutations of the numbers one to four. And as we put them into a storyboard earlier as well, that tells us that there's going to be 24 ways to enumerate the first two by two block. Um, so that's the first block done. And you might be thinking that's a lot of work to do for one block. And um, you, yeah, you're right. Um, but it actually gets a lot easier from here. Um, so we'll move on to the first column and the first row. Um, and as you can see, we've got, um, I'll use my mouse, we've got one and two in the first row, and then we've got two blanks here, which are represented by the red dots. Um, if we think of this as making a cup of tea again, we've got the tea bag in first, which was the number one, then we've got the sugar, which was the number two. So all we've got left to add is the milk and the hot water, which is three and four. And these can go in any order. So we could have one, two, three, four, or we could have one, two, four, three. Um, so we have two choices there. Um, then if we look at the first column, we can enumerate this in exactly the same way as we did the first row. Um, but obviously we've got slightly different numbers. So we've got one and three, and so that leaves two and four to go here. And obviously, as we said, they can go in either order. Um, so we have two choices for the red dots and two choices for the green. But now what? What do we do next? And um, this is something that I got caught up a bit with when I was working out the calculations um, originally. Um, so one thing we could do is um, have a look at what happens if we enumerate the second row and column. And so you can see they're filled in with um, the cyan and magenta. Um, we've chosen the numbers for the first row and first column. As I said, these can go in any order. So the first uh, row could be one, two, four, three, if we wanted to. But we're just going to go through with this example. Um, so in exactly the same way as we did the first row and the first column, we can do the second row and the second column. Um, so we've got uh, three, four. So this, mean, this, this must be one and two in any order again. And we've got two and four. So this must be one and three again in any order. Um, so that allows us to create this grid. Brilliant. Um, as I said, this is just an example again. We could have, say, uh, these two numbers, two and one. That could be one and two if we really wanted. But we'll go with this one. And then all that's left to do is uh, finish doing the, the, uh, the fourth block. So um, let's fill in the blanks. So we'll put the one in. And then we'll look at where we can put a two. We can't put the two in the third row because we have the green two on the left. So the two must be in the bottom. So let's put it in the bottom right cell like that. Then we'll move on to the three. Well, we can see that we can't put the three here because we have the um, pink three there. So it must be here. But hang on, we've got a three up the top. We've got the red three. And so that leaves us with sort of no choice um, of where to put the three. We've got an invalid grid. Um, so we must have made a mistake somewhere. Um, so let's go back to the drawing board. Um, so if not the second row and column, then what? Um, so we'll take the second row and column away. We did the first row and column, obviously, at the start. We'll keep them, but we'll go on to enumerating the fourth block, the bottom right block. Um, so let's have a look. So we've got a four in the first row and column in these two blocks in red and green. And that is because we had the four in sort of position two across and two down in the first block. Um, and because of this, this means that there must be a red four and a green four. And obviously, these can be in any position. As we said, this is just one example, but the 
top row, for example, could be 4-3 if we really wanted it. Um, but in this example, we've got the fours as we have them. Um, and as you can see, the green one completely wipes out this fourth row. And likewise, the red one completely wipes out the fourth column. And so that must mean that the four um, in the fourth block must be in position A. That's the only place it can be because we've already got four, uh, we've got three fours on the grid already. Um, so what next? We've got our four in. Well, if we look at the green and red numbers again, we have a two and a three there. And so there's restrictions on where two and three can go. For example, uh, two can't go in position B, so it has to be C or D, and three can't go in position C, so it has to be B or D. Um, the only number there that doesn't have restriction on it is the number one. And so we could put number one in any of these uh, remaining positions in the fourth block. We could put it in position B, position C, or position D. Um, so let's look at when it's in position D. Um, so obviously we only have position C and D left to fill. Um, and we've got the numbers two and three to put in. Well, we've got the red three up the top in column three. So it can't be in position C. And so that must mean uh, number three is in position D. And that would leave two to go where C is. So there's only one possible enumeration when we put that one there. So let's look at the one in position C. Well, very sort of similar to what we've just done. You can't have the two in position B, so you have it in D, and then the three has to go in B, and that's valid again. But it's the only valid one when we've got the one there. Similarly with the one in position D, uh, we've got even more restriction here. Uh, both the two and three have restriction on them, and so it must be the two in position C and three in position B. And so from there, we've generated three um, possible enumerations to sort of complete the final block. And now we only have the uh, second or the completion of the second row and the completion of the second column left to do. Um, and we only have one number to go in each of the third and fourth rows and columns. So these can be easily filled in. So for example, if we look at this middle grid, um, on the bottom row, we've got four blank, one, two, or well, that blank has to be three. And then similarly with the third row, we've got two blank, four, three. And so that blank has to be one. And if we imagine that, so we've got the three at the bottom, the one there, that completes this row as well, uh, this column, sorry. So that works. And then similarly, if we get the same thing with the uh, third and fourth columns, we find exactly the same. That generates a valid enumeration. And from all of these grids, we can do the same. And that gives us these three possibilities. And that's the only possibilities given our choice of um, first block and our choice of completion of the uh, first row and column. Um, so now it's just a case of bringing it all back together. So we had four, uh, four factorial possibilities for the first block. So that's 24 possibilities. Um, then we had two factorial possibilities for the completion of the first row and again for the first column as well. Um, and then we had three completions for the fourth block. So that was our position to put in the one. And obviously, as we said, there was only one possibility to put the two and three in when we had the one there. Um, and from there, we had the completion of the uh, second row and column. And there was only one way to do this. There's only one way to fill in the blanks. And so if we multiply all these numbers together, that gives us our final answer, which is 288. So there are 288 possibilities for the enumeration of the uh, four by four Sudoku grid. And that's it, now we're done, or are we? Um, so there's actually quite a few things to consider um, after we've done this. Um, obviously to some people that's enough, that's a satisfying answer, but to others, they wanna consider another factor. Um, so what is that other factor? Well, I'm gonna show you two grids here. Um, what do you notice about them? Um, so it might not be very obvious looking at it just from now, but um, if I do this, that might be a bit clearer. Um, so I'll give you a couple of seconds to look at it and sort of think why, why is there something familiar between these two grids? And the answer there is essentially just that they are, um, I can hear someone's put something in the chat, I can't see the chat. So I'm guessing you got it right. Um, I hope you got it right anyway. And it's essentially that it's just mirrored on the horizontal line. Um, so there we go. So as you can see, the uh, one in the top left has gone down to the bottom left on the grid on the right. And similarly, the four on the bottom left, that's gone up to the top on the 
one on the gr uh, the grid on the right. And you can say that with any numbers, it's just essentially mirrored along that central horizontal line. Um, so some people would look at these two grids and say, hang on, they're just mirrored. So they're not unique, they're the same enumeration. And that's a really interesting thing to think about. Um, so how do we look at this? Um, I like to look at it with biscuits. Um, and I like to make my own biscuits and when I do they look something like this. So they're squares, half chocolate. Um, my chocolate never looks that good, but we'll pretend it does. Um, and when I dunk them in my tea, I'm oddly specific about it and I only like to dunk the biscuit so that it is square on with me. So the front of the biscuit or the back of the biscuit is facing me and such that a flat edge is um, sort of parallel with the surface of the tea when it is dunked. And it probably sounds very strange and like I've just made that up, but I actually find that that's the best way to prevent um, the disaster of the biscuit breaking and falling into the tea. Um, so let's think about how many ways I can hold this biscuit so that my biscuit can be dunked properly. Um, so the first thing that we can do um, with the biscuit is flip it 180 degrees. So just like that. So we've flipped it horizontally. Um, so obviously when we saw the Sudoku grid earlier, that was flipped vertically. This is horizontally this time. Um, so we've essentially just took the left hand side and flipped it over to the right. Um, and we can do this twice before the biscuit returns to its original orientation, which would be what we see on the left. So if we did that same flip on uh, to the biscuit on the right, we get the one on the left again. Um, what else can we do? Well, we can rotate the biscuit 90 degrees. Um, so you can see on the left, we've got the chocolate on the bottom. If we turn it 90 degrees clockwise, we get the chocolate on the left, and then again, takes the chocolate to the top, and again, the chocolate goes on to the right. And then if we did it again, we get back to that biscuit on the left. Um, so we can do it four times before the biscuit returns to its original orientation. Um, so the horizontal flip, which was the first one we saw, uh, we said that that could be done twice before the biscuit got to its original orientation. So we have what is called orientation. Similarly, with the uh, 90 degree rotation, um, that can be done four times before the biscuit returns to its original rotation, uh, orientation. And that has order four, um, as we said. Um, so why is this relevant? Well, this is where a section of maths called group theory comes into play. And um, so we've got the question at the top there. Um, what about flipping the biscuit vertically? So we flipped it horizontally, which was um, where we took the left hand side and flipped it over to the right. Well, um, if we flipped it vertically, we'd have this. We'd have the back of the biscuit facing our scale, but the chocolate would be at the top. Um, so why haven't we factored this in? Well, actually, this is exactly the same as flipping the biscuit 180 horizontally and then rotating it 90 degrees twice. So we've actually already factored this in. And you could say the same about any other orientation that's valid for dunking. Um, so we can just obtain any orientation that we want from combinations of the horizontal flip 180 degrees and rotating 90 degrees. Um, so we had four valid orientations of uh, the biscuit when the chocolate side is facing us. So that was our four rotations. And then if we flip the biscuit to the chocolates facing away, we had four more rotations and that gives us eight um, rotations in total. So there are eight orientations of the biscuit which are suitable for dunking. Um, and in maths, these are known as symmetries, as I'm sure um, a lot of us are aware. I will just define what symmetry is in sort of layman's terms. Um, essentially, just the orientations of the shape which maintain the shape's original footprint. And we've got an example here. Um, so if we have an irregular rect a rectangle, so that's where two sides are longer than the um, sort of adjacent two sides. Um, if we rotate it 90 degrees, we can see that it's it wouldn't fit in the same uh, position as the original one. And if we flipped it 90 degrees again, it does fit in that same orientation. Um, so that, that second rotation is a symmetry of that particular rectangle. Um, so you could think of it sort of like that, I can't remember what it's called, was it a hole in the wall or something? That TV program where they have to sort of like fit into the, the wall as it. So what's that got to do with Sudoku? Um, well, Believe it or not, the biscuit has got a lot in common with the um, 4x4 Suzuki grid. And in fact, the, um, the symmetries of the biscuit are identical to that of the Sudoku grid. Um, and they are generated by exactly the same actions as the um, rotations and flips um, that we did with the biscuit. 
And so we can see here, if we did do those, uh, we've got up the top, we've got the um, original orientation on the top left. Then if we rotated it 90 degrees, we'd have the one next to that and rotate it again, we'd have the one next to that. And we keep going. And then the ones down the bottom are identical to the ones up the top, but we have flipped it 180 degrees. So obviously the numbers are sort of upside down and sideways here. Um, disregard that, just pretend they're the right way around. That's just for the sake of illustration. So we've got symmetries in Sudoku. And so um, it says here, some say that a truly unique enumeration is one that cannot be reached through rotating and flipping, uh, as well as through the following symmetries, which are listed below. So we've got swapping column one and two with, uh, oh, sorry, swapping column one and two and or three and four. And so that's essentially just, um, if you imagine we've got our, our block up the top, our, our top left block and the one below it, if we just swap the columns there, and the same with the, the top right and the bottom right, if we just swap the columns around, we, that, that counts as a symmetry, um, but we can't be swapping sort of columns across blocks, so we can't swap two with three or two with four, because then we'd be changing the, the blocks there. Um, similarly with rows, we can do exactly the same thing, um, and we can swap the, the 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 blocks. So we've got um, our Sudoku with our, our our four blocks, our one and two up the top, and three and four down the bottom. We can swap one and three with two and four. And similarly, we can do exactly the same thing with rows. Um, and we can also relabel the entries. So for example, if we have a block of a Sudoku grid that is one, two, three, four, we could sort of swap the two with the four and as long as all of the twos and fours within the whole puzzle are swapped that counts as a symmetry um so each one of these symmetries is a unique enumeration um and that they're all included in our 288 possible enumerations that, that we counted and so we're going to have quite a few enumerations that are duplicated through symmetries within our 288 um so in order to find the number of truly unique solutions, we must use the orbit stabilizer theorem from group theory. And um, I'm not going to go through that because it's quite an in-depth thing, um, and that's for another time. But if you are interested, please email me afterwards, and I can send you some resources that sort of uh, talk about the orb orbit stabilizer theorem in relation to Sudoku's. Um, and it's a really interesting thing to read. But I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, all we need to know that uh, all we need to know is that from applying that theory, um, or that theorem, sorry, we get that there are in fact only two valid, uh, truly unique enumerations of the 4x4 Sudoku grid. And I think that's amazing. I think that from 288, we can reduce it to just two. I think that's really mind blowing. Um, and now we're done. And we're really done this time. Um, but I do just want to give you some more information in case you are interested. Um, so as I said, uh, the techniques that we used on this grid are equally valid on the nine by nine grid. There is a little bit, well, a lot more work to do on the nine by nine grid. But if you can do it with the four by four grid, that's a very good starting point for the nine by nine. Um, and in 2005, it's found that there are, I'm not going to read that number, um, but there are that, that amount of enumerations of the nine by nine grid. And they're not, uh, sort of truly unique how we defined that. We're, they're just sort of the equivalent of our 288. Um, if we wanted to look at truly unique ones, um, this was found in 2006. And as you can see, it's a lot smaller than that first number. Um, but there we go. That's that's the amount of truly unique solutions to the nine by nine grid, or I should say enumerations, not solutions. Um, so if you want more information on this, um, that's a really good starting point, that link there. Um, if you want to take note of it or if you want me to send it to you afterwards you can contact me that's absolutely fine um and that's me done i'm really done now <laughs> so um thank you everyone for listening thank you for coming along uh, to listen to me um and as i say if you do have any questions then please do email me um i'm happy to take emails and answer emails and i'll pass back to um georgina thank you Thank you, Shay. That was really great. I'm sorry for a couple of interruptions there, but I really enjoyed that personally. I'm sure everyone else did.